Hi, and welcome to Hope Chapel of Greenville, a church based upon four pillars, preaching the authority of God's Word without apology, lifting high the name of Jesus through worship, believing firmly in the power of prayer, and sharing the good news of Jesus with boldness. We hope that today's message is a point of spiritual growth for your life. And now, here is Pastor Will with today's message. Take your Bibles and please turn to the book of Philippians chapter 3. I want to begin by asking you a question. What is your story? What is your story? Some of us here are older and we have a story and we could probably sit down and talk with you about what our story is and what our life is like and what we have gone through in, in our existence some of you are here and you're young and, and you're looking forward to high school even and you're looking forward to college and the future and who you're going to marry. You don't know who that is. You don't know who your children is. I remember sitting in churches and the man was preaching and I was thinking, I wonder who I'm going to marry. And I didn't know how wonderful she would be. But I knew that God was good and so it was going to be wonderful. I didn't know how many kids I would have. For me, 12 would be fine. I would love, I would love that, all right? I didn't know, but that's, that's a, you gotta, there's two on that one, all right? There's two people's opinions on that one. And so, Lord, whatever you bring is fine, uh, but a, a lot of them is, is really, really good. I didn't know what type of kids they would be. I didn't know what would transpire. I, I didn't know that we would have twins. That kind of blew us out of the saddle a little bit. Um, but God had his plans and God has his ways. And now 25, 30 years later, I look back and what I didn't know back then, I can see God's hand all the way up until now. Some of you are not in that position. But what is your story before God? Because listen carefully, God is writing his story in your life, every single one of you. And it's not going to be like you think it is going to be. Well, I, I, I'm going to be... A, I'm going to be a preacher, or I'm going to be a missionary, or I'm going to be a businessman, or I'm going to, I'm going to be the wife of a, a whatever. It may not happen that way. You may plan and direct your attention to something, and all of a sudden God takes that and turns it a 90 degree or a 180. And all of a sudden, how many in here are doing something different than you thought you would do when you were in high school? Okay, that ought to tell us all something, all right? How many, new, how many that are younger than high school or high school or younger who know exactly what's going to happen in your life? Raise your hand. There are no hands, all right? Because we all have an idea, but the question is, God, what do you have for our lives? And so what we're going to look at today is Paul's testimony. Now, we've all been to those testimony services, right? We've all been to those testimony services where it's kind of like somebody says something and the next person has to kind of up that. All right. So the person says, you know, I, I uh, was a sinner and God saved me. And well, I, I was a really, really bad sinner and, and uh, I was uh, really doing stuff that. Uh, and the third person says, well, I, you know, I was I was way out. I mean, and it gets upping. All right. And everybody's trying to up the, what the Paul here is giving his testimony. And Paul here tells you who he was and what he was and what trans transpires in his life. And last week we looked at that aspect of his life and we applied it to our present situation. But Paul was just telling us, I was throwing stuff out. Well, now we're going to find out today the stuff that Paul says he wanted to bring in. We drew a line in the sand last Sunday and talked about what this church was not going to be. We're not going to be a church it's filled either with legalism or license. We're not going to go to the extremes. We want to be a church that's filled with truth and grace in our lives and in our community. We all make mistakes. Everybody here makes mistakes. One of the reasons I love pastoring a smaller church is because I know you. And I know you got problems. I know you got problems. All right? And, it, and, and we come here to church on Sunday morning and we all kind of act like everything's good. Bruce gets asked, hey, how you doing, Bruce? Fine, fine. And it could be lousy, terrible, and it's what, what's the answer? Fine, fine, the Lord's doing good, good stuff. We don't do that here. We just lay it right out there. Somebody asks Bruce, how's it going? Terrible, rotten, my wife's not here today, all right? So it, be honest, all right? And that's who we are in this church. We're a bunch of, 
a people that are struggling to do what is right. We, we make mistakes. Have you made a mistake in your life? Say amen. amen. And turn to your neighbor and say, I made big mistakes. <laughs> if it's your wife or your husband, they already know that. <laughs> but we fail in this place. We, we, we fail in this place, but we will not. We will not stay down. By God's grace, we presume love and we get back up because we're trying to live in God's paradigm. The title of today's message is Living in God's Paradigm. A paradigm is a model, it's a, a pattern, it's a typical uh, example of a frame of reference. And Paul lays out before us God's thoughts on the present circumstances of the church. And we are to live like Christ before men who do not know Him so that we can draw them to Christ I call it providential thinking. Other people call it biblical worldview. Some call it a uh, happy and holy lifestyle. But today I want you to look at your notes and the division of the passage is I've written it out there for living in God's paradigm, living in God, according to God's viewpoint means rejoicing in the Lord by despising self-gain and displaying Christ's fame. So we went over last week, what does it mean to rejoice in the Lord? Now, brothers and sisters, I will not be a pastor of a boring, dead church. It's just not, I'm, I, I quit, all right? I know I have to talk to the Lord about that if I ever do quit, but uh, no, we're not gonna be a church that's dead and boring. I don't want teenagers coming here and going, do I have to go to church again? Because they look at all of us who are at church and thinking, what sickness do they have? Because we're so fra Don't do that. I don't want teenagers sitting in the back row, all right? <laughs> Bored stiff, all right? So if you, if you watch them back there, there's three of them I'm keeping my eyes on. Are you okay? Or it's this, okay? I'm watching you guys. I want teenagers to be coming to church and say, you know what? I'm getting something out of it. I'm learning something. I don't want you to come here and be bored out of your mind. But that's going to not just take a guy up here that's going to take you rejoicing in the Lord. And that's what it means, to rejoice in the Lord. Because that's what Paul said. He said, finally, brethren, look in verse 1, chapter 3. He says, finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Paul, that meant a lot to Paul. And then he went on from there, and he discussed the reason he can rejoice in the Lord is because he despises self-gain and we went over that last week, what all that meant. But then today we're going to be starting in verse 7 and going through 11. And the final one is displaying Christ's fame. What does it mean to display Christ's fame? Now, um, I didn't have us stand up and read this passage of Scripture. We read it last week. But I want you to start looking at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, now I want you to note this. What things were gained to me, these I have counted lost, for Christ. You got that? So Paul simply made this statement in, ver in verse 7 is the hinge verse between the first six verses and the following to verse 11. So 7 is your hinge verse. And he says, what things were gained to me? And he's, what, he, what is he talking about? The things that he's listed in verses 5 and 6. There's seven of them there that he listed. Circumcised the eighth day, stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, and on and on. He says, all this stuff that people look at to say, see, this is my pedigree. This is my credence. This shows that I am a good and spiritual person. Paul says, I throw it all out as trash. Now, I got comments last week because I said bull crap in the sermon, all right? Yeah. All right. Now, I want you to look at verse 8. What's the last word in verse 8? Well, in, in, in my, and this, this is the only Bible you, you're, you're in. Okay, if you've got some tone, phone thing. No, I'm just kidding. In verse 8, he ends in my, in my text, the word I'm trying to get, he says rubbish. Now, do you use rubbish? If you're in English, it's rubbish. It's just rubbish, all right? We're not that way. We're not from England. We've got some Canadians here, and they use rubbish, all right? That's fine. But what do we say? Trash. That's a great word to say, trash, all right? If you're in the Midwest and you're a farmer, what do you say? And nobody wants to say. See, everybody's like, I can't believe he's talking about it, all right? 
But I just want you to know in the Greek, in the original, that word for rubbish is exactly what the Midwesterns say. It's exactly what it is. It has a connotation with it, okay? So if you're upset with me about saying bull crap, all right, be thankful that I didn't say th the next word, okay? But Paul is making a statement here, and it's very important that I want you to get it. Because he says it three times, and I want you to see this, because we're going to go to the third point today, which is that we are to be people who rejoice in the Lord by despising self uh, gain and displaying Christ's fame. That's the third point there, displaying Christ's fame. And then I give you three things under that because this is how you display Christ's fame. Now, I want you to get this, all right? I want you to get this. Paul says this in verse 7, but what things were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. You get that? He said, those which were gained to me, I've counted lost. Look in verse 8. Indeed, I count all things loss for, uh, for me excellence, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, of Je uh, for Jesus Christ, my Lord. For whom, again, he says it a third time, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish. All right? He says it three times. Do you get it? When Paul says something three times, what is he doing? He's walking right up to you and doing this. Get this. Now, in fact, look at verse 8, and you see the first two words, yet indeed. Those are five Greek words translated with two English words. Five Greek participles that he is saying this. Yet, even, indeed, at least, therefore. All of that is in those two words, yet indeed. What does that mean? It's a little lesson I want you to get. Do you know when I come up to you and I say, listen to me, get your eyes up here, think about what I'm saying? That's exactly what he's doing in a, verbal, in a, in a literary way. He is saying, let me have your attention. Get, because what happens is when he's speaking, he knows what most people do when somebody starts speaking. All right? And so you hear me say this often. Listen to me. Listen to me. Get that. Get that. You say, okay, get that. That's just what he's doing in verse 8. And he is saying this statement. You've got to understand. What, no, 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 no. No. You don't have an option on this. Okay? You're going to listen. Paul, that's what Paul's saying. You're going to listen to me. Okay? So he says, I have counted all this stuff loss for the excellency of Christ. He makes that statement in verse 7. And then what does he do in verse 8? He says it two more times. After he says, you get this? You get this? Okay, that's what he's saying. Yet indeed, therefore, and. Those are all slated right there in the first verse of eight, in the first few words of verse eight. And then he is saying a very simple thing, and it's the thing I want you to get this in your notes. Value eternal treasures. Value eternal treasures. Verses seven and eight. He's giving them an alert. Listen to me, listen to me. I want you to hear this. I want you to get this. Get your eyes open, get your ears open. He's giving a very loud and strong statement. He wants their attention. He's saying, don't miss this. I count all things lost. Pause. He has just said in verse seven, he counts seven things in verses five and six loss, which are, circumcised the eighth day, stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews. He says, I count all that stuff as rubbish. I count all that stuff as trash. And then he says in verse 8, I count just not those things. I count all things for loss. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And then he says again, for whom I suffered, I have suffered the loss of all things. What does that mean? It means he's given all that stuff up and it's all been taken away from him. Value eternal treasures. What do you mean, Pastor? Remember when Jesus was on earth and he said this phrase? No man can serve two masters. No man can serve two masters. And he makes a div division between God and what? It's kind of a funny word. Starts, 
mammon. What's, what's mammon? Money. money. And Jesus Christ made the statement, you can't serve God and money. Now that's Christ saying. Did Christ ever say something that's not true? He said, well, wait, I can serve God and mammon. I can serve God and money. God said, Jesus Christ said, no, you can't. So if you're serving money, you're not serving God. Okay. This is what Paul's saying. Paul is making the statement, you can't, listen to me high schoolers, listen. You cannot serve both yourself and God. You got that? You can't serve God and yourself. You gotta make a call. And you talk to anybody in here who's got gray head, they'll tell you the exact same thing. You can't serve God and anything. It's just God. You see that? But what the devil does is he tries to like bring all kinds of things into us. Gives us all kinds of possibilities. Oh yeah, yeah, go to church, go to church, but serve yourself at church. Let me ask you a question. Do you think you can serve yourself at church? Oh yeah, you can. God says that all that stuff, Paul, Paul makes this say, all that stuff is literally trash. Why? Because I want Jesus Christ, that I may gain Christ. Here's the goal, the delight, the treasure of heaven. I'd like for you to circle that in your Bible and highlight it in your phone. All right, now that I've got to say that stuff. Circle that in your Bible, highlight it in your phone or iPod or tablet, that I may gain Christ. Circle that, that I may gain Christ. That is what the goal is, that I may gain Christ. What does it mean to gain Christ? What does it mean to gain Christ? Let me, let me talk to some of you older guys, all right? When you were in high school, what did you want? Think back. You're in high school, what did you want? Tell me. What you got, Earl? Car. You wanted a car. What kind of car? Corvette. Corvette. All right, what color? Red. <laughs> How big the engine? Oh, at least, right? All right, that's what you wanted, all right? And we can talk to the girls on this too, okay? Um, but what did you want when you were in high school? What are some of the things you wanted? Trey? All-star athlete. Somebody else. What did you want while you were in high school? You and I were on the same track on that one, and neither one of us got anywhere close, but it, we were there, right? We, we had good, vi yeah, okay. What else? What were you thinking in high school that you wanted? Move out of the house. Move out of the house, all right? She wanted to get out of the house and on your own. And become a doctor, okay? Was that in high school you wanted to become? No, that was not. What else? What did you want to become? What did you want to become? Ted? NBA superstar. <laughs> you and me both, brother, all right? What did you want in high school? What did you want in high school? What did you, want to, what did you, what did you say in your heart? Boy, if I could just get that. Yeah. And and gave me a vision of things I could do and a and a contentment for that. And while I still wanted the fast car, I'll I'll ride with you. <laughs> I enjoy that. Um the the cars are awesome, uh beautiful wife, all those things. Um but uh I just uh there are a lot of things that I didn't get. When did God start working in your heart? As a teenager. Teenager started drawing you to himself. So you started making a differentiation between, okay, I got all that stuff, but what really, really matters is this over here. Now, every single one of us, I was in junior high. I was in junior high, and God put a desire in my heart to be a pastor in junior high. My problem was, okay, I'm going to have fun before I have to do that, <laughs> literally, all right? <laughs> I'm going to have some fun before. I mean, not bad stuff, but I'm just going to have fun, all right? Sports became a big deal for me big deal for me. It was my idol. It was my God. And I wanted to be a professional at it. And Jesus Christ said, you got one God, right? And Paul comes up to this and he says, listen to me carefully. He says, I count it all rubbish, all of it trash, because you're not going to get the excellency of the knowledge of Christ with loving anything else. That make sense? Whatever it may be, 
whatever it might be. I wrote in my notes, I said this, it's either Jesus or nothing. What do I mean? Jesus doesn't take people who say, God, I want you and other things. Jesus says, no, 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 it's only me. Jesus is an exclusive individual. And my question to you today is this. Is he the only thing that is your God? See, I've got an evil heart in me. John Calvin used to make the statement, the human heart is a factory of idols. You get to be a high school student, you start thinking about, boy, I, she's really cute. Wow, she's, she's really, really cool. God says, it's only me. Get a little bit older, say, I like that car, or I want that job, or I want that position. God says, it's only me. Now, here's my question to you. Do you consider or count all things rubbish or trash in comparison to Jesus Christ? Because that's what's on the table. Value eternal treasures. Earl, how important is that car in comparison to the life of your children? Nothing. In the life of your wife. What's, this is going to be a tough one. What's the comparison between Debbie, your kids, the car, and heaven? There is none. You know that I won't be married, you won't be married in heaven? To the person that, we're going to be with Christ. And Christ said there's no marriage in heaven. Why? Because we're all married to Christ. We're the bride of Christ. Brothers and sisters, listen. Think of your world in comparison to heaven. Eternal values. Think of it in eternal values. The car and the houses and the people and the position and all that stuff. Does that stuff matter in heaven? Absolutely not. Why is it bagging on us now? Does it make sense? Some of you are struggling through physical difficulties. When you get to heaven, you're dancing. Amen? Rudy, you will be too. You'll be dancing. She ain't never danced a day in her life, but she's going to be dancing in heaven, all right? We are. Value eternal treasures. Value eternal treasures. The second thing I want you to look at, and Paul goes on here, and I want you to see this. He says in verse 9, and be found in him. Now that word found in him over 75 times, Paul refers to this idea, found in him, and I want you to get this. Now this is a little bit elevated, all right? I love my high school guys, all right? Eighth grade and on, I love them. You know, they're looking at me like, okay? You can get this. I had high school, I was a youth pastor, and I had people in this place that were in my youth group, and they got it, and you got to get it. Okay, listen to me carefully. You've got to understand the second point is vindicate positional truth. And so what in the world do you mean? What does vindicate mean? You're saying, Ron, what does vindicate mean? Prove to be true, true, dead on. And I didn't give that to him ahead of time, all right? He's just an older guy like me and he gets that definition. Vindicate positional truth. What is positional truth? We know what truth is. It's the opposite of falsehood or error so we got that and it says god is truth so vindicate okay verify make sure it's all right okay positional truth now get this what is positional truth you have got to understand i'm doing that thing what paul says all right those five particles you got to get this positional truth is what god says is true that you may not see you got that it's truth that god says it's true because he said it so all right? So let me ask you a question. Do you always feel like a Christian? You said, this morning I didn't feel like a Christian when I was yelling at my wife. No, there are times where you don't feel like a Christian. Question, but are you a Christian at that time if you know Christ? Amen. So that's positional truth. My feelings do not determine it. It's positional truth. Okay, my dad said to me when I was a kid, you're a loneliness, and there is nothing in this world that you can do to stop being a loneliness. 
And in my smart alekiness, I said, I can change my name. He says, you can change your name all you want. You're still aloneness. You got my DNA. Now, this was in a very serious conversation. Because my dad was moving into sin. And I know it's sin. And he and I are sitting down talking about the fact that he has decided to sin. He's going to divorce my mom and remarry. And we're having a conversation. That, those are, you, you hate those, all right? And I was upset with him because of what was going on. And he looked at me and said, there is nothing that you can do in your life to ever change the fact that I am your dad. And you are my son. That's positional truth. Got that? That's very important for you and me to get with our Heavenly Father. Because the devil, one of the ways that he gets at you and me is by to try to convince us that we are not in positional truth. Do you believe once saved, once truly saved, always saved? Okay, we believe that. Anything can change that? Can, can, can the devil change that? Can you change that? Can your sin change that? Once saved, always saved. Always true? Okay, that's true. We don't want to abuse that, but that's perseverance of the, of, of the saints if you're, if you're reformed in your background. But the, the point of the matter is, is when God saves you, he says no one can take you, no power can take you out of my hand. Now we agree with that, correct? So we are Christians. Even if we blow it, even if we mess up, are we still Christians? What happens if somebody takes away our desire and we just don't want to go to church anymore? Are we still Christian? If, if God has saved us, what? We are Christian. That's positional truth. And so what Paul is saying here is he's got to get this. Look in verse, verse 9 where he says, and be found in him. That's what Paul is making this statement. I am found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. He is saying this, this statement. The righteousness which is from God by faith. Three things under this point you've got to get as far as this, this uh, vindicating positional truth. You are accepted by God because of Christ's righteousness. You're in uh, Philippians. Turn over a couple of books to the left, all right, in your Bible, just go like this on your phone. Or this way would be th that way, all right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And when you've got it, look up here. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. We'll find out all the people who are really good at, at uh, going to their scriptures quickly. You know, a nice thing, when I, was, when I was your age back there, when I was your, we used to have those... Um, Sword drills, your Bible drill, I mean, and you, everybody had, the, you know, that was a wonderful thing. Wasn't that great? Everybody had to hold your Bible up here. You couldn't have your finger in like that. That was illegal, all right? So then they got real specific, and you had to have all hands outside, and you hold it like this, and then they would say, Hezekiah 4-2. <laughs> and everybody go, and I would go, why? There was no Hezekiah. <laughs> so if you didn't know that, oh, right? But they would do this, and you would learn the, the, the scriptures, all right? They're very, very, very important. I think that's really important for our kids to learn. I'd love to see all of our kids coming out of fifth grade knowing the 66 books of the Bible. You know what we ought to do? You should have everybody stand and say, okay, when you don't know the next book, sit down and start with the book of Genesis. Ready? Oh, we don't like that. <laughs> we don't like that. Okay, let's get back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, all right? I've thought of those things before, by the way. All right. So there's no Hezekiah. I just want you to know that. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Okay? Let's read this. For he made him who knew no sin. Who's that? Talking about Jesus, right? For he made, for God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us. What doctrine is that? What truth is, what theo theological doctrine is that? It starts with an I. Next letter is M, P. Imputation, okay? Imputation, what does that mean? Simply this. And you gotta get this, this is important. Every Christian needs to know this because it is at the core of your salvation. It's God taking 
the sin of your account and putting it at Christ's account and taking the righteousness of Christ's account and putting it at your account. So all of a sudden now what? You are the righteousness of God. You say, what? Look at this. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Circle that verse, memorize that verse, hold on to that verse. That is one of the most important verses in the Bible. For God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin that you might be made the righteousness of God. The reason you're accepted before God is not because like we talked last week, you do all of this stuff, all the rules and all that stuff. That has nothing to do with it. Please get this. You can't go to heaven by doing mass. You can't go to heaven by giving money to the church. You can't go to heaven by prayer. You can't go to heaven by going to church. You can't go to heaven simply because you do all the stuff. It doesn't save you. It's God saying, I placed the righteousness of Jesus Christ into your account, and because of Him, you come to church. You come to, uh, uh, to heaven, and you go to church. <laughs> but it's because of that. Before Mark knew who Christ was, he didn't have a desire to go to church. He didn't want to go to church, but what happens? God changes his heart and what transpires? He's coming to church. He's driving 45 minutes to come to church. He's leading and helping in worship. Why? What in the world is that all about? There's a guy who didn't care about that. God changed his heart and placed to his account the righteousness of Christ. This is positional truth. And th you say, I know that. But when the devil comes to you and starts talking, in the, you know, you, you, we all have those tapes, right? And the devil comes to you and says, you're lousy, you're a failure, look at all the stupid stuff you've done. Anybody have ever heard that tape? Yeah, you got the same tape I got, all right? The devil comes and tells you all the rotten stuff that you are and have done from the beginning. And you need to change that tape and you need to hear righteousness of Christ. Righteousness of Christ. Righteousness, amen? Righteousness of Christ. I mean, he needs to write a song on that. Righteousness of Christ. So you start answering that and the devil comes to you says this you have nothing to do with this I don't have anything to do with this it's God amen God is the one who brought the righteousness to my account so that's the positional truth that he's talking about there you are accepted by God because of the righteousness of Christ and positional truth is kind of hard to get to now we're going to get a little bit scanty right now all right um and I, I might get in trouble for this, but I, gotta, I wanna illustrate what I'm saying, okay? Positional truth, now you're really wondering what I'm saying, all right? Positional truth is sometimes difficult to handle. It is, because it's just true even though I don't see it being true. I was trying to think in my office, how do I explain this? Let me give you this explanation. All of their lives, a Christian girl loves the Lord and a Christian guy all their lives are told modesty, modesty, don't touch, right? You told that? Don't touch. Don't look at the wrong things. Guys, listen to me. You're told look in the eyes, look in the eyes. I've talked to too many women where the eyes, the guy's eyes are not in the eyes of the girls, right? And all the women are going, yeah, yeah. Guys, keep your eyes in the eyes of the girls. You're not looking at any place else. You're saying, boy, we're getting there. Yeah, well, we haven't even started yet, okay? So we're taught this all our lives. We're taught this as men. Only look in the eyes of the girls, okay? And all the girls are taught that one word, modesty. Dress modestly, right? And you're taught this, and you're taught this, and you live this out, and I'm a Christian, and I want to live modestly, and I, I want to dress modestly. I want to dress in such a way that people are not offended. I want to dress in such a way that people are, guys are looking in my eye, you know, all that stuff, over and over. And you go out on a date, and what do you say to your son when he goes out on a date? Do, you look in her eyes and do not touch. You touch, and I kill you. You got that? I... I cleaned that out with my boys. I said, you're not dating. You're not dating. And they haven't dated to this day. And we don't got grandkids coming. 
<laughs> and they're 26. So if anybody help me out with that. But I, I told, no, you're not doing that. You're, you're, not, you're not doing that. Now get this. So I was, I was single till I was 31. No, don't do that. Look in the right. Okay. So I walk this aisle. Get this. I walk this aisle. Beautiful girl is there. And we make vows to each other. And the dad who told me, you're never going to date my daughter. I should have put that in my vow. <laughs> no, I, that, another story. So I make my vow to her. He says, it's all consecrated. This is great. We walk out. Something changed? Well, he made a statement. You know what that statement is? It's so cool to make. I, I've done it numbers of times. Now, according to the power that's vested in me by the state of South Carolina, Ohio, wherever, Hawaii, all right, I pronounce you, in the authority of the gospel, I pronounce you what? Things change? Position different? <laughs> yeah. A friend of mine got married. And you know how you, you, get, you change clothes to go down the road? They wear the traveling clothes or whatever because they get out of their gown and all that stuff. They're changing, they're getting ready to change clothes and, and the deacon says, oh, okay, you can change over there and, and to her, you can change over there. And the guy said, shouldn't have, the guy said, we're married, we can change. He said, no, you're not doing that in the church. <laughs> what was the problem? Deacon was having problems with what? Positional truth. Wait a second, husband and wife. I will tell you, it was really tough on me and now you're saying, oh, no, and Maria's going, where is she going with this, okay? Where, uh, it was tough on, because for 31 years, you're saying, no, 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 and in a 20-minute session, now what? Yeah, 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 okay? What happened? Positional truth, and it took us a while to understand, wait a second, I have to act like a husband and a wife. Isn't that true? That's positional truth. That's what I, I, I want you to get at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we we have a wonderful relationship. So yeah. So <laughs> so what I'm saying is this: if God says you're His child, what? You're His child, Amen. and it doesn't matter whether you feel like it or not, and it doesn't matter if you fail or not. What matters is that God of heaven says, you're my child. Amen. And there is no power that can take you away from me. Amen? That's what Paul is saying here. It's not by my righteousness. It's not by my righteousness. It's not by my good deeds. It's by the fact of Jesus Christ's righteousness has been placed to my account. It's the last point we're going to look at today. Okay? Verify progressive reality. Now I'm going the opposite direction. Okay? First of all, it's vindicate the positional truth. Now it's verify progressive reality. And this is one of the most profound verses in the New Testament. Back to, you're in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, back to Philippians 3, 10. And what's the first phrase of Philippians 3, 10? Powerful, powerful. What does it say? That I may know him. Can I tell you something? There's not a greater person to know in this world than Jesus Christ. Guy started a sermon by talking about Brad Pitt. I was listening to it. It was about this passage of scripture. He said, just the mention of the name Brad Pitt and all the girls get goosebumps and all that stuff. He was brought up in a Christian home. Did you know that? Strict Christian home, Midwest. Gave it all up. There's rumors where his wife, what's her name? Angelina Jolini, what? <laughs> Angelina what? Yeah. She just did a movie with a guy who died who was a Christian. That movie was called... Um, uh, he was a, sec a World War II hero broken unbroken and and he witnessed to her and there's rumors that she made a profession i just 
I will laugh all throughout eternity over that. I'm getting away from Christianity, man. I said, forget this Midwest. I'm going to go Hollywood. I'm going to get married. I'm going to find a girl, and she gets saved. Great. Okay. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'll tell you this. All the stuff that he's running after is worthless. It's rubbish, and it's trash. Why? Verse 10, that I may know him. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, there's no greater joy and knowledge in this world and in the world to come than to know Jesus Christ. Amen? Because that's what he says. Look at that. In verse, in verse 10, he says that I may know him, and I want you to get these three things, and the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Three things. There's three things in knowing Jesus Christ. The power of his resurrection. What's that all about? And I say, okay, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. What's, what, what's, what is the resurrection so big? What's, why is that such a big deal? It's seal of salvation. True. What else? Help me out here. What does that mean? What is salvation? Why is it so, uh, the resurrection? Why is it so important? Eternal life. What else? This is what, you, you, this is what we oftentimes meant, uh, uh, miss because we're in progressive truth here. It's biblically true but the big thing was this. Death is the result of sin. And so everybody that sin has to die. Every single one of them. Resurrection does what to death? It conquers death. So that I might know him and the power of his resurrection means this thing here, this resurrection gives me freedom from what? Death and sin so it's the resurrection of jesus christ that breaks the bonds of sin in my life now you have got to get this there is no sin that is greater than the resurrection of jesus christ in your life you got that so you're you're sitting here well you know i i just i'm falling to this sin all the time i'm doing all the, i keep doing it i apologize i keep doing it i apologize i keep doing it i apologize i can tell you this right now the resurrection power of jesus christ gives you freedom from that sin you say well i keep failing that's part of our human existence brother and sister the key of the matter is this acknowledge it confess it get up and move on because it will not have dominion over you do you get that? Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's your key. Paul says here, I want the power of Christ's resurrection in my life so that I can live and move and work out Christianity. You are not bound to any sin. You do not have to sin. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Men, you're struggling with pornography, you're struggling with, with thinking things that you ought not to think. I'll tell you right now, there's victory in Jesus Christ's righteousness over the power of that sin. Ladies, you're struggling with gossip, or you're struggling with, with thinking that other people are better than you and the insecure, all that stuff. I'll tell you right now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is more powerful than that sin. And you can be free. You are free indeed. Scripture says, amen? So that's what Paul says, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection in my life so that I can look at any sin and say, you have no control over me. Now, you're going to sin and I'm going to sin. But sin and evil will not be a dictator over Christ's children. You are free. You live in liberty. You are free in Christ that I might know him. That's the first thing, power of his resurrection, okay? The progressive reality that as I know Christ more and more, and this word for knowing is a word that means an intimate, ex experiential understanding of a person. And so it means this, that as I grow in my life, as I get older, and the gray heads in here, we know more about the experience of knowing Jesus. I lost a son. I know the experience of Jesus in the losing of son. You may have lost a mate. You know the experience of Jesus Christ with that. You see what I'm saying? It's the experience. It's not positional truth. It's experience. I sense God here. Does that make sense? 
It's knowing Christ in the rubbish of life. Do you get that? It's knowing God. It's knowing Christ in the rubbish of life. So that's the resurrection power. And the second thing he says, he says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. What's the second one? And the fellowship of his sufferings. I got news for you. Okay? News for you. You're going to suffer as a Christian. You say, that's news? Well, I thought when I got to be a Christian, everything is good. Uh, it just started. And you're going to suffer. I can't go all through all the things I wanted to tell you. I'll, I'll illustrate it this way. I was telling the guys, I just got a phone call from one of my sons. My son suffers. He's not a perfect Christian. He's in the special forces. He's designated driver. So he goes to those places and he sits in a corner and he says, I brood. That's his, he said, what are you brooding about? He said, I'm brooding about that I can't be out deployed, shooting guns and blowing things up and all of that stuff. And I'm brooding over the fact that political situation as it is. And I'm brooding over the fact that they're training me to do this and then they're not letting me. Do it. So he's brooding over that stuff. I said, why are you doing that for? He just keeps people from me. He's not perfect. He said, no girl walks up to him and offers anything. No guy walks him because he's, he's scowling. He said, I purposely scowl. Now, whether that's right or wrong, I'm just saying. But he said, dad, when you suffer for being a Christian and a goody goody and you're pastor's kid and you're a virgin the big the v card he said it's tough i said son all that is because you're a christian if you weren't a christian you'd be just like him that's suffering for christ and your kids your kids will suffer for jesus christ too just as you have suffered for jesus christ you say how I take a teenager, take her to high school. All of a sudden, she's trying to, to live right. How does everybody respond to her? Whoa, goody two shoes. Oh, our kids got that. They suffer for Jesus. You go to you you go to work, and at lunchtime, you know that that un, that awkward time when everybody's sitting around the table and you all got your food, and what's everybody doing? If you're with a bunch of guys, they're just chowing in and you pause and you bow your head. You don't make a big deal, but you pause and bow your head and thank the Lord for the food and bring your high. What's everybody doing? <clears throat> Excuse me. And then they pray. That's suffering. You say, well, that's not a big deal. No, it's not a big deal. But brothers and sisters, God promised you. Paul said this, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You're going to suffer. Some of you are suffering with your mates because you want to do what's right and they don't. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, I know and I love you. But we all, including the, we all work on our marriages. It's just not easy. Anybody in here found that marriage is really, really fun and easy and no problems? You're lying if you put your paw up. No, it's tough. It's hard. How many, have, how many here have been married? Okay, now your kids are looking at you, okay? How many in here have been married and struggle at being married? Put your hand up. Yeah. I think every married couple in here has put it up. Yeah, I struggle. I, she's wonderful, but I struggle. You know why? Because I'm sinful. You should say that at the marriage. I just want you to know, honey, I love you very much, but I'm really sinful and I'm selfish. So I want things my way. And she's going, mm hmm. Got that? Got that? Okay. But it's a struggle, it's a suffering. See? Paul says, you're going to suffer, but there's fellowship with Christ in the suffering. My question for you is have you committed yourself? Have you committed yourself to suffer? Have you committed? Are you ready to go to those high school reunions or go to those high school? And I'm going to stand up for Jesus. 
I've talked to some of you guys in here and your boss wants you to do something that you shouldn't do. <laughs> I can't do that. How does the boss respond? Well, he may fire you. In fact, I've, this being, anybody gotten here fired because you wouldn't do wrong? Anybody here? Laid off, Laid off or fired? The, in other words, the boss or somebody says you need to do this and you know it's wrong and you say, I can't do that. Yeah. Does that happen? How'd that feel? Real good, huh? Yeah. Real, I can promise you, and I don't even know what Trey was talking about. I can promise you, if he lost the job over it, when he walked away, he was happy. <laughs> I hope it wasn't part of that. I mean, it's one of those things, okay, if you don't do that, you don't get her. So you, God's up in heaven going, okay, he made it. All right, you get her. All right, and I hope it's not that way. But sometimes we, we suffer for being a Christian. And that's right, and that's good. And the last thing, I've got to go on. I could spend all day on this one. But the last one, being made conformable to his death. That's weird. Wouldn't you think he would say being made conformable to his life? Then wouldn't that make sense? But he says conformable or being conformed to his death. What is he talking about? Look at the next verse. That I may attain unto the what? Resurrection of the dead. So what is he, what is he saying? Please get this. It's the last point we're going to. Conformity to Christ's death is this. When Christ came to live on earth, he was born to die. Jesus Christ was born to die. His whole purpose in life was the cross. Right there. His purpose in life was to the cross. You and I are the same way. We are conformed to that. The application of that is this. It don't matter whether you like it or not. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Don't matter. Why? Because you've already died. When you came to the cross, you died. When you asked Jesus Christ in your heart, you died. A missionary was going over to a foreign field on a boat 100 years ago. And he was going to these headhunters. And the sailors got to know the, you know, they were on there for a month, month and a half at a time. Sailors were on there and started laughing at the Christians because they would have their, their Bible studies and they would pray and they were laughing at them. And then, but then they got close to them and they really enjoyed being with the, with the uh, missionaries. And one of the sailors said to the missionary this, you know what, you shouldn't go to those guys. I know them. I've seen them. They're headhunters. They kill people. And your head's going to be on one of their stakes. You're going to die he said, within a couple of months of getting over there with him. You know what his response was? You don't understand. I already died before I got on this trip. Because Paul made that statement. I die daily. Brothers and sisters, that's our calling. Our calling, our calling is to be made conformable to the death of Christ. So I live my life based out not on what I want, but what, on, what Christ wants. Does that make sense? So don't ask yourself, what do I want? Or what's, what do I like? Don't ask that question. Ask yourself, what does Christ want? Because I die to Christ. Do you get this passage of Scripture? That I might know Him. That I might know Him. This is, this is His heart before His people. That I might know Him. And the power of His resurrection. And the fellowship of His suffering being made conformable to his death. That's our lives. May it be so in this church. Let's pray.